I have had a long career of going out and covering uh, foreign wars, small wars generally, insurgencies in Latin America since 9-11, a lot of time in Afghanistan, in Iraq. And I began um, in 2009 after I published my book on Iraq. I came back to focus on Afghanistan and trying to figure out what was going on there. And what caught my eye among the many uh, complexities of that war was this initiative that had been launched that had various names. It was called Community Defense Initiative, Local Defense Initiative, and then the name that stuck was, it's a long one, Village Stability Operations and Afghan Local Police. And I'll explain the, the two-part name there. But it turned into really the biggest and longest endeavor by special operations forces since Vietnam. And I felt really compelled to get out into the field and cover it, write about it, and try to produce a chronicle of the initiative, what it entailed, um, how it turned out, and what we might learn from it for the future. Uh, it's, it's also a much less t told story than the bin Laden raid. So I really felt it was important to balance uh, some of the stories that have received so much attention with a, an initiative that has tremendous, I, I think um, the scope of it is tremendous and the potential implications uh, are also tremendous. Kunar has, if you go up beyond Asadabad, up north of Asadabad, it turns mountainous very quickly. The Hindu Kush massif is just uh, really quite impenetrable. So there was this kind of soft belly of the agricultural valley that the special ops teams moved into this is where 80% of the population of the province is. And they found a willing population there. Um, the, the structure of the village defense program was to limit the number of volunteers to 300 in each district. So the idea wasn't to build vast militias, but really a local defense force that would be robust enough that it could survive, but not big enough that it would start um, you know, becoming a military power unto itself. The problem was, as this initiative really took on uh, esteem, uh, and I should actually pause for a minute and say, I, I do think that the special ops teams were very talented in the way they worked with the local population, but I came to realize the places where it succeeded really required a charismatic Afghan. It, Afghan leadership was just essential. Um, and in the case of Kunar, there was a fellow named Noor Muhammad. He's a local, he was a native there. He became, became a very avid recruiter. Um, he not only helped recruit for his district, but then he helped go to the next districts. Now they had their own leadership, but he would go and help them. Um, and it wound up with four districts really supporting each other. I called them the Band of Brothers. Uh, so it really didn't matter. They weren't getting a lot of support from the provincial chief of police. They had a lot of problems with the provincial level government, but they were knitting together and providing this real grassroots um, uh, safety net, security uh, net. The problem was on the border with Pakistan, there's a village called Maya, and Maya was a Taliban base, and it was being used as a way station and a transit point. And the, the first team that was there when I started going to visit said, we, this, something has to be done here because they can come down the valleys, these lateral valleys from uh, the border, and they're into the populated area in no time. So from my first visit there, it was really pointed out as we got to do something about this. But it was right on the border. And of course, as the US-Pakistani relationship became increasingly uh, tense, they had a hard time getting permission to go and do, um, they wanted to do a, a raid into the village uh, to capture weaponry and any Taliban they found. Now they weren't doing this unilaterally, they, they were doing it with the Afghan commandos, which was another big part of the special ops mission in Afghanistan. They've um, uh, built a, a fairly uh, substantial uh, sized uh, Afghan special ops 
uh, command with subordinate units. Uh, it's generally considered the most proficient unit of the Afghan military now. So they finally got permission to launch a raid into the uh, village of Maya, and they got the air they needed, the aircraft, the, the helicopters to drop them in. And of course, they go in at night because it protects them. Um, it's, it's much harder to shoot down a helicopter at night. Um, so the Chinooks came in at night, and they came under fire right away. You can hear a Chinook from a couple of miles away. There was no doubt this was Americans coming in. Nobody else has Chinooks out there. Um, and they started taking fire from the Pakistani border posts. And the, this incident, when I read the New York Times today, and they called this a wayward strike. This was the November 2011 uh, incident that had a lot of cascading consequences. Um, and I had been there just two weeks before this occurred. So the Chinooks come in and land. They come in and they have to make multiple landings to get all of the Afghan commandos out uh, on the ground. And the mountains just go straight up from their landing zone. And the village is nested right there at the foot of these very steep mountains. So they're getting shot at and mortars and uh, materials raining down on them. And the um, chief warrant officer, who was the ground force commander, uh, called for a show of force by the F-15 uh, jet that was on station to provide cover uh, in case they needed it. And he, um, his men were under fire and they were being bracketed by mortars. The mortars, you know, they're being walked into their position. And so it was very much a life or death situation for these men on the ground. And he, he did not want to call for an airstrike, though. He thought, if I can just convince them these are Americans down here, they'll stop firing. So the F-15 came roaring through, made a pass, another pass, and then a minute later, they start receiving fire again. So it was quite clear that this was an intentional attack on these uh, troops down below. Did it succeed? Did it work overall? I think the critical parts of the Afghan countryside were secured by this initiative. And in places like Paktika, another critical border province where there really was very little conventional force presence um, and a very critical corridor. Um, and that was largely due to, again, a charismatic Afghan. I would say observing over the last 12 years and getting increasingly immersed in the details of special operations and what they do, there is no doubt that they have um, proved themselves to be uh, very versatile and very useful in a variety of modes. Before, you know, pre-9-11, it was hostage rescue. You know, there were sort of limited tasks and, and very discreet rendering safe nuclear weapons. You know, they were thought of as uh, a 911 force you called in to do discreet missions. And today, they're working in a, a number of capacities. They've been out there with conventional forces side by side. So, so I think their utility is very widely recognized. But the size and the budget, I think you have to look at two things. First of all, sequestration, you know, that's a broad measure. They've taken their haircut along with everyone else. Of course, they're trying to argue and saying, look, we're 33,000, uh, but we've been used so widely. We're deployed everywhere, 77 countries in a given year. You know, please don't cut our budget. But sequestration is the law of the land, and while it is, they'll take their cut with everyone else. What is most important in my mind, and what people I think haven't focused on yet, is the implications of a shrinking military overall. Because most special operations forces are recruited out of the conventional forces, because they want people that are already knowledgeable and experienced in the basic military skills. So then they try out for uh, these elite units. And you, I think you will see a shrinkage proportionate to the cuts of the overall military. Um, I, I know they are loth to accept this, but the alternative is to lower the standards. Uh, and the first rule that you'll hear out of any special operator's mouth is quality is more important than quantity. I, I do think that Colombia is a success story. I lingered on Afghanistan be, in part because people have such an overwhelmingly negative view 
of the situation there, and I'm actually less pessimistic about Afghanistan's future. We can talk about that more, but let me talk a little bit about Colombia because I have actually I spent a lot of time in Colombia. I love Colombia, and first, like many reporters, I was focused on the drug war because that was what the American angle was, and then I realized, well, over half the country is in the grip of this insurgency called the FARC, um, and they had been in control of much of the countryside for decades. And the Colombians, and it really did take Colombian will uh, to start uh, grappling with the fact that their country was in the grip of an insurgency and they needed to uh, start uh, getting after it. The Special Operations Forces came in and trained a uh, very capable elite Colombian uh, special ops force, but they also provided advisors to the regular Colombian units at all echelons. There was also USAID and a wider government uh, USAID program, um, but it was done at a, at a pretty low uh, level. I think the total over 11 years was $7 billion. Now that may sound like a high price tag to you, but if you think about the sums we've spent in Iraq and Afghanistan, it's a bargain to have now a, not only a stable major Latin American country, but what they call an exporter of security. Because the Colombians are actually now training other Latin American uh, troops. They're helping in West Africa. They even sent people over to Afghanistan. Uh, so they're really uh, growing up to be a partner. And that's a payoff. That's a return on investment that I think is, is pretty remarkable. And the group that has been of most uh, contention has been the Haqqani Network faction of the Afghan Taliban. And I think that if they trust that the U.S. will be around to help provide some advisory support and make sure things don't go south and that India doesn't take over Afghanistan, you know, they have all of these bugaboos and I think it just needs to be a reassurance that isn't going to break the bank for the U.S. You know, we still have troops in Kosovo. Does anyone know that? You know, a small number of advisors uh, to help see us through and I'm very concerned that everyone is so exhausted and has such a negative view that they don't understand that this is now the end game. The end game is now, it's not that costly, but if you don't do uh, the right thing now, you will have wasted all of that money and all of those lives.